This is the Hard Thing Podcast. Today, we are overcoming average. Welcome back to another episode of the Hard Thing Podcast. This is the podcast that helps you overcome average, step up above mediocrity, all by doing hard things. Our goal here is to help you improve your lives in meaningful ways by getting you to do those hard things that are in between you and the life that you want to have. So we want to give you the tips, tricks, tools, and tactics that you need to improve your life. And that can look like whatever it looks like, but inevitably, we are going to get you to be a better person. And today is our Monday show, so those of you who are new, you're going to hear from me and a guest, a high-performing guest today. Uh, I'm really excited about that, but first, a couple announcements. One, I'd like to invite you to join our Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash the hard thing podcast. There you can connect with other like-minded individuals who are like you trying to do hard things to improve their lives. And the best thing about it is you can build a high performing network. Today we talk a lot about putting yourself near others who are trying to do things with their lives. So that's what you can do with our Facebook group, facebook.com slash groups slash the hard thing podcast. Next, I'd like to invite you to help us raise $1,000 for Operation Underground Railroad. They're a nonprofit organization that goes undercover to rescue kids from sex trafficking. Imagine your, your most loneliest time. Now imagine being that lonely and also having someone abusing you every single day or multiple people, different people abusing you every single day. That's what these kids who are in sex trafficking, that's what they have to deal with. That's what they live in. They are slaves. And Operation Underground Railroad rescues them. So if you want to help us help them, go to GoFundMe.com slash Overcoming-Average. Help us raise $1,000 for OUR, and uh, we can save some kids, hopefully. <clears throat> now, let me tell you about today's guest. Today, I talk with 2016 Olympic rower Hans Struzina. He is a realtor, a real estate investor, and the host of Another Way to Play podcast. Uh, Today, we talk a lot about a championship mindset, putting yourself around nines and tens, hiring nines and tens, and what it takes to win and how to form your identity around that in a healthy way. I found today very insightful. I enjoyed the conversation a lot. He's a fun guy to talk to. And uh, frankly, uh, I'm not an Olympian. Uh, And so it was really interesting to to get inside the mind of an Olympian and see what it's like and and really understand what it means to be high performing. So enough of me. Let's hear from Hans Strazina. All right. Well, thank you for being on my show, Hans. I'm very excited to have this conversation with you. Justin, it's my pleasure. Really appreciate you having me on and really excited to be here. Perfect. Well, let's start off the show asking the question I ask all my guests. What is the hardest thing you've ever done? When you, when you posed this before we started recording and then even, you know, when you invited me on, you sent me that question and I've been sort of trying to figure out how to answer it ever since then. And I mean, physically speaking was definitely my, my pursuit to the Olympic games, which basically was from 2015, September, 2015 until the Olympics in, in middle of 2016. And, you know, it, and, and honestly it was a, a 12 plus year rowing career before that, but like that year was physically probably the hardest thing I've ever done. <clears throat> and just from an exertion and multiple workouts a day for, you know, basically a year and very few days off. Um, It just got tiring and really hard and all of that sort of thing. And we can dig into that later. Um, I would say sort of outside of like a physical pain um, was really the, the mental rebound after coming out of the Olympics, which uh, we went in uh, really obviously trying to medal as everybody does. And we had a really good shot to do it. We came up short, we were fourth place and we, and I, everyone took it in a different way. And I, I took it as like a total failure and that it meant that I was a failure and it took me, you know, the better part of two years to really digest that and become okay with it. And then really re uh, re-examine what it meant and reassign meaning to it more, most importantly. Um, and then from there c- trying to rebuild confidence and trying to, um, you know, redefine that whole experience for myself. Like, like that was kind of a emotionally and, um, non-physical pain, hard, 
hardness that I went through in, in the years after the Olympics. Well, uh, I actually, <clears throat> those are both things that I uh, had marked down that I want to touch on because I, I, it's such an interesting story because most people probably can't relate to being an Olympian and then having to come down from that monumentous high as, as you've described. But a lot of people can certainly relate to having to step out from a job they really loved because of health or something like that. And, and like you, having to redefine themselves, their lives, their direction. Um, so I, I wanted to ask, you mentioned that on your team, and obviously rowing from what I've seen is a heavily, a heavy team sport, but mm -hmm. each person kind of took that loss and the subsequent pivoting, I guess, differently. Mm -hmm. What do you think determined how each person dealt with the, the, the fourth place and then moving on. Dude. <laughs> um, one of the things I left out earlier was just that I literally hadn't talked to about this to most of that team. Like I, one guy on that team who I was particularly close with, he and I have talked about it a little bit, but you know, I mean, shoot, I didn't even communicate with a bunch of those guys for like six months after the games. I think mm -hmm. everyone just had this sort of, uh, unspoken separation, which was weird because we had just spent all this time together, come together as a team and really tried to achieve the pinnacle of sport for our, for our sport. And, and then we, in the, you know, five and a half minute race, we're all of a sudden like we need distance. And it was kind of one of those things. So, I mean, honestly, everybody had a different upbringing a different set of skills a different path to get into that boat and, and sit on the line for the olympic final um and so I, i'm sure all of that as was the case for sure with me played into them responding to the to the fourth place finish the way that they did and and i honestly couldn't tell you um what everyone's motivation or reasoning for it was yeah well that makes sense because um everyone deals with things <clears throat> everyone deals with things differently. Uh, and like you said, each of us have different upbringings and, and different experiences that lead to different choices. So I'm, I'm very curious and, and hopefully I'm not overstepping, but how you reacted, why did you react? Would you have reacted the same way if you went back and did it again? And what would you have done differently? I guess, <clears throat> knowing what you know. Meaning, now. meaning like, in retrospect in the four, like finishing fourth place back in 2016 or like how would I change things going forward if I were still training after, after the fourth place. So, so dealing with it, cause you mentioned that there was kind of this, this moment where you were a little bit lost kind of coming down and you had mm -hmm. to redefine things and you were very yep. not happy with the result. And so how would you have changed things with how you dealt with the, the fourth place? Yeah, that's, that's tough, man, because I mean, the, the answer that I want to give is to say, I would have, uh, my, I wouldn't have allowed my self worth to be tied up in my sports performance in the same way. However, I think it's necessary to perform in athletics at that level to have your self-worth and your identity tied up in your sports performance. I don't think you get to the Olympic games and certainly not to the a final uh, or just the Olympic team period without just eating, breathing, sleeping, you know, your sport. And, and so, I mean, in retrospect, I would, <coughs> I would like to have, I would like to think that if I can, chose to continue training and rowing that I wouldn't have, um, you know, dug in as deep with the, you know, with the alignment of like my performance means I'm a good or bad person. And I think you, that part you can start to build some maturity around and really um, uh, uh, separate those two things a little bit. But at the time, you know, that's what I had to do. To, to bring the best performance I could so that I could have the best chance of making the team and then doing well once we were there. Um, yeah, man, that's, that's a tough one. <laughs> that's, that's a tough answer. No, I think you answered it incredibly well. Uh, from what I've understood, from what you're saying, you're proposing that there's kind of a dichotomy and it's wrapped up in your self-identity. So you identify as a high-performing rower, but you, mm -hmm. you can't go so far as to say, you know, your eternal worth as a person is predicated on whether you win or lose, but you still wrap your identity up in that. Is that right? 
Yeah, man, a hundred percent. Cause it, you know, I, I started rowing when I was 14 and obviously a very formative time in anybody's life, of course. And, and so I found some early success and found a tribe and found, you know, a group of friends. I went to a really small private high school. I think, uh, let's see, my graduating class had 82. Wow. And so, and, and, and about half of us had been in the same school, not physically on the same campus, but in the same school system. We had a couple campuses that you move through and uh, since kindergarten, like we had like almost 40 of us were, were had known each other literally our entire lives. Wow. And, um, as you can imagine that, that bred of a, a touch of a sheltered existence. And so when I got onto the rowing team, at this very formative time in my life, I met kids from all these other private high or private and public high schools, and it just opened my worldview. So, so it, just to say that rowing, not only from like an athletic standpoint, really helped define me as a person, but just like who I was, my who my friends were, the the things that I learned about, the other experiences I got exposed to, all of that stuff. I was just tied in so deeply, and at the time, it was necessary and. I'm still, I still think it was necessary. It really helped me form a lot of my worldview and a lot of um, friendships and a lot of just ways of viewing things. And uh, it was, it was really incredible, but, but the dark side of that is of course, if, if the performance doesn't go well, you know, and, and you've just built this world around you and this friend group all around in rowing, and then they see you as this performer and then you don't perform or you don't get the medal or whatever, it's like, okay, shoot, I just, I just failed. Therefore, I suck, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And that part, that part's the part that I would say, like, I am, like, the, the part that you're worthy of love and affection and, you know, even just friendship um, outside of the fact that you're an amazing rower, like, that's the part that I would want to change, not necessarily the rest of it. Yeah. Our brains have this weird tendency, I think, and obviously depending on the person, but this weird tendency to kind of go a little bit too far with the sentences we create. So I failed at this, and then our brain just fills in, therefore, I must suck as a person. And I think, right. you know, we, we definitely need to learn how to cut off that last bit. Yeah, yeah, that's that's really well said. Yeah, and I also think it translates not just, you know, in the world of athletics, but high performing, high performers all over, because I don't know. Are you familiar with strongman competitions at all or anything like that? Oh yeah. So I read uh, Eddie Hall. He has a, a biography and I, <laughs> the whole biography is about how he is the kind of person that when he does something like he goes so much into it that everything else in his life kind of suffers. And I feel like that's kind of a common trait uh, among a lot of high performers. They, they kind of, they let a lot of things not necessarily go by the wayside, but they're just so, like you said, their identity is wrapped up in what they're doing, that they become it, uh, you know, kind of an incarnation. So I think that's very interesting. But I wanted to ask, oh, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, that's that's kind of the hard thing about that high performance. I've been watching the uh, the Michael Jordan documentary series that's that everyone's been been excited about and I'm most of the way through it now but I totally identify with him obviously I've never had the problems he's had but just sort of being all consumed with it and you know obviously he had a ton of fanfare and he couldn't like go anywhere in public without getting mobbed so like I don't totally understand that part yeah. but um but you know it's like but you need if you're going to be the guy who's Michael Jordan in your world um, or the girl, of course, like you have to go all in. Like you can't, it, at that level, you're talking about milliseconds or, pound, you know, one pound or a quarter pound to lift something a little faster, a little bit more. And like, you just have to dedicate and you have to go all in because if you don't, someone else will. And that that's going to be the difference at that level. Yeah. Uh, that reminds me in high school and I mean, this is no comparison to or Olympic athletics, but in high school, before football games, we'd always listen to that part on uh, the movie Any Given Sunday. Have you ever seen that? Yeah, it's been a while, but yes, I have. Well, yeah, well, there's that part where Al Pacino basically says, life's a game of inches, like you're saying, you know, one pound higher or lower, and it's the difference between winning and losing. And uh, mm -hmm. I think that's, that's a mentality that, <coughs> excuse me, that's a mentality that high performers definitely inculcate into their lives. I wanted totally. to ask you though, what made you choose rowing? 
I, at least where I, I live, that's not like a common sport. So what made you pick that? I grew up in the Seattle, Washington area, so the Pacific Northwest, and uh, rowing is a very well-known and pretty popular sport, relatively speaking. Um, back back when the University of Washington founded its athletic program, uh, it was football and rowing, basically. Those were the two sports, and those were the two sports that people knew about and followed. Like peop- like Rowing had a bigger following in the United States at one point than, it, than college football did. Crazy. Oh but uh, it it did, and so it wasn't. And, and because the 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 community is all around the lakes, and any of the listeners or you, if you've been to Seattle, like there's Lake Washington, Lake Sammamish, and the Puget Sound, and almost no matter where you go or where you are, you're going to see a body of water um, on your way to and from something if you're in in the area, and and oftentimes you're going to see rowers, so it's just visible there. Um, our my, one of my parents' friends told us that you could get involved by just going down to a boathouse and taking some lessons, and they thought that would be a fun thing to do as a family, so we did. And long story short is uh, I was athletic. I uh, I grew late, so basketball was a challenge, track and field. I was okay at all of those things. I was, like, making the A team, but I was, like, lower down the depth chart. I just really wasn't – I hadn't grown yet, really, as mm-hmm. part of it, and I had a – a, a confidence issue with, with growing late. Um, but then I found rowing and I realized like it wasn't necessarily about out jumping somebody or tackling somebody or whatever, but it was more about being efficient in my seat and, and putting out a certain amount of Watts on the erg. And, you know, eventually I started to figure out that it was, it was more of a team effort coming together. All that was one to move this boat, faster than the other boat and and just something about that really clicked with me and then I just leaned into it and and kept going and found success like I said earlier and you know made the JV squad pretty quickly and then the next year was just in the varsity and started to find out that I had a a natural ability to to be good at rowing and just took it from there wow uh so the word that comes to mind when as you describe it is synchrony and uh I want to ask again, um, maybe not again, but what does it take to be a good rower and a good member of a rowing team? Yeah, so t- being tall is an advantage, absolutely. <laughs> um, especially as you get into the higher ranks, um, being tall helps. Uh, but but generally speaking, from a sort of a physiological standpoint, having a big uh, big body, strong, really strong legs, and a strong core is is critical. Um, having a really high VO2 max, which basically means your ability to process oxygen, um, and uh, and then obviously from a mentality standpoint, you really have to be uh, a very stubborn person because it's a repetitive sport. So you have so you're really trying to perfect. <clears throat> your timing, the way you're shifting your your body in very small micro ways, um, and then doing it while you're while you're you're going as hard as you possibly can at 40 strokes a minute down the race course, and um, and then obviously there's there's a huge team component here. Like you can be a total stud, uh, but if you're a jerk and no one likes rowing with you, there's going to be animosity in the boat, and uh, and the boat's not going to go well. And, and so you need to be able to work with other people uh, to make an eight, a four. Obviously, you could row in a single and whatever, but that's, what, <laughs> that's not most people in the sport. Um, but yeah, having that team mentality and, and really trying to plug in with your strengths and help other people with their weaknesses and that sort of thing and is, is also really, really important. Have you had any team conflict experiences that you've had to deal with? Oh yeah, of course. <laughs> Can you give um, us an example? Yeah, man. Like, there's there's many that I can sort of draw on. I was fortunate to be part of a lot of really good teams, and like our college program, um, definitely just set a bar in college rowing at the time for what is possible. We we ended up having a string of successes where we won as a, as a school, five national championships in a row and six out of seven um, 
a couple years before that. And I was on uh, the 2009 and 2011 team. And the 2011 team was the first of those five. And we had a really strong culture around winning, around working hard, and, and that really went well. But even in that group, um, there was there was there were challenges. Like I can remember times when um, people would get really upset about a boating selection, or they would get really upset about um, you know the way a practice went, and and sometimes you know it came to blows or it came to words being said, and and having to as a group sort of come together and be supportive of the situation, but also being strong enough as a, as a team to sort of rise above some of those situations. It's, it's not a, it's hard to, hard to exactly say, but, but really it was, you know, as, as you have in athletic uh, competitive field situations, like, there are hurt feelings and there are, there are disappointments and there are um, tough decisions that, that get made, but realizing that, that that's one thing we talked about on the, on the UW team a lot is, you know, the, the team, like you make the team look good. You do this for the team um, that ultimately on that crew or in that group of crews really, I think prevailed in the end of it. And the people who didn't buy into that culture either kind of got demoted down the ladder or uh, ended up just kind of being out on the fringe and, and weren't really part of that group in the way that those who really bought into it were. Wow. So it, it sounds like you're not only forming your own personal identity as a high performing rower, but you're forming a team identity as a high performing rowing team and everyone yeah. has to form into that. Right. Yeah. And there's a lot of trust that goes into that. Um, you know, cause when you're in the boat, you don't have like, there's not a really good way to measure output. Um, they have a lot more sensors and stuff now that you can throw on the boat that it's getting way more advanced, but it's challenging. It's like a 50 foot long boat and you're out on the water. Like how do you collect data on <laughs> effort? Right? Like that's kind of a challenge, but it, uh, but there's a lot of trust that goes into it. And that's why you train a lot. And that's why you row a lot together and you watch video together and you do all these sorts of things um, because you want to have that reputation of being trustworthy, of being the guy who's got someone else's back when they're having a bad day or when, when the race gets tough and national championships on the line that they're going to, they're going to put out and they're going to step up and, and get it done. Well, uh, being part of a high performing team is, uh, I, I mean, you could, I think it is uh, Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi, the, uh, maybe it's not him, but anyways, he describes the process as flow and uh, mm -hmm. being on a team like that, it just seems like that is the standard operating procedure. You know, you're always on the, on the game and everything always goes right. Um, and, and you mentioned that you have to build a certain amount of trust and going back to what you said earlier about how after <clears throat> 2016, uh, you, you got fourth place and then for six months it seemed no one really reached out to each other. Um, why do you think you had so much trust and then you just didn't, you didn't reconnect or anything like that? <clears throat> well, to, to be totally honest, um, it wasn't, there wasn't a lot of trust. Like there was enough trust to get us there. Um, the cohesion of the team was not a hundred percent like it should have been uh, to win a gold medal. Like, you you really have to hit it perfectly on the day and if you have like these little issues with trust or you know uh or frustration or just a lack of confidence in any way like the likelihood of you ending up on the podium goes down pretty drastically and and that's a in my opinion a direct result of the culture and the problem with our with our federation at, broadly speaking is that there was very little trust and transparency in the process not just that year but like systemically for many many years and you know there were coaching changes and there was ambiguity and like who got invited to what and um the selection procedures and who got cut and for what reasons and like there was just a lot of that happening. And then we enter into the biggest year of everybody's quadrennial. So we go in four year cycles. Mm -hmm. All, all of us had, a lot of us had been training for at least four, if not eight or sometimes 12 years. 
after college to get to that point. And then all of a sudden there's this really ambiguous process and system and the coaches are, are saying work really hard, but you know, we might like, it might not work out for you because I don't feel good about your rowing this, this at this point in the year. Um, you know, that breeds a lot of resentment. And so most guys said, this is competitive. This is dog eat dog. And we have to, I just have to look out for me. And that works to a certain degree that breeds a really competitive environment. And it, and it did, there was a lot of competition and a lot of guys going for it. And I think it helps sharpen a lot of us and it, and it sort of forced some of us together, some pulled away. Um, but at the end of it, you know, we, we still ended up with some pretty big egos and some myself included, uh, and, and differing opinions on how to, come together and row this boat for success. And at the end of the day, when the pressure's on and you've got even just a slight difference in opinion, plus an undercurrent of like the distrust of like the whole season, um, you know, it just, it's, that's the 1% right there. Sure. And, and so to answer your question is like, it wasn't that surprising actually that we sort of separated after the lack of uh, the result we all wanted. It's, actually probably what you should expect. It's like guys yeah. had to go in their own way because they just came off of this really intense, you know, emotional roller coaster. Um, and they just needed to, to go do their own thing. Cause that's frankly what a lot of us had done up until that point. Yeah, that makes sense. So it sounds like, uh, as we've been talking, <clears throat> each one of you had solidified your identity as a high performing rower. Uh, but, but that team identity had never really solidified. Um, so yeah. learning from that, what sort of things, and not just in rowing, but even in, you know, you're a realtor now and you're building businesses, mm -hmm. investing, what sort of things are you seeking to Im implement in order to create high performing team, but also high performing individuals within that team? I mean, it's, uh, to me, it's, it starts with a very clear vision and leadership, um, one thing that was really weird that I that I I don't know that we ever really addressed, but we never actually talked about what our goal was. Hmm. Now that I come to think of it, for that whole year, like it was sort of like understood that we were trying to win a gold medal, but no one ever said it. Yeah. And in fact, people were like actively not saying it because they didn't <laughs> want to like jinx it or like get too far ahead. And to me, as like such a goal oriented human, um, I always kind of thought that was weird. Now that I think about it, it's really funny that I'm, we're recording this and I'm thinking this just now. But anyways, yeah. um, so to answer your question, it's like setting goals very clearly. Like, where are we trying to go? That's, that's really important, right? Because if, if you've got a stated goal um, that's like, we want to go win a gold medal at the Olympics, and then you have people who are like, I don't know if I can do that. It's like, okay, you've helped sell, you know, you don't want to go there. Like, that's cool. You don't yeah. just you're not part of this, this group because that's where we're going. So there's, so there's definitely a stated goal of like, I just brought on a VA to help me with a lot of my social media stuff, for example. And I said, the goal of our social media is to get more clients, to, to provide value and to have people see us in a way um, that we will, we will be the, the obvious choice for them because we provided so much value through what we put out there for free. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and, and she's like, okay, that's great. I mean, there's, it's a little bit more nuanced than that, but sure. basically that's the goal. Secondly is, um, is hiring nines and tens. And what I mean by that, and this is something that, that was articulate. I think that's such a great way to articulate it, but um, finding the people who are like really winners, who have a championship mentality and mindset, who, who want to go and, um, do something amazing. Cause if you hire people who are just like ho humming along and trying to work <laughs> for an hourly wage, like you'll probably get the job done. It'll probably be pretty good. It'll probably be decent. It'll probably be okay. It'll be something like that. But like if you, if you hire nines and tens, you're going to find those people are, I mean, they're more, a little more expensive and they're harder to keep, but that's going to a keep you as a leader really focused and, and, delivering to keep them interested and B they're going to, once they get buy-in and know that you're, you're really looking out for them, they're going to go above and beyond for you and deliver 
so so much more than you could have ever paid them to do in the first place right so there's yeah. there's that mission there's the hiring and then there's sort of that that culture that you created of having these like very high performing uh highly capable people that i think is just absolutely critical well i think what one of the things you said there uh, having a vision is so is wildly important have you have you read the book it's uh gosh discipline no the four disciplines of execution by sean covey I- I have, I have not actually. Oh, no. I would highly recommend that one. <clears throat> On it, he talks about wildly important goals and he talks about lead and lag measures. And uh, mm-hmm. he says that we're always focused on these lag measures. Like I want to, um, I, I want to, you know, lose 10 pounds, but we never focus on the goals that get us there, you know, and things. And basically he talks about how you can't win a game if you don't know the goal. And you can't right. win a game if you don't know how to score a goal or how to keep track of how many. And so I think that's so fascinating that no one ever said, this is what we want to do and this is how we're going to do it. You know what I mean? Right. <clears throat> yeah. It's, <clears throat> yeah. So, so definitely having that goal and then, and then getting the best people who were on board with that goal and can see it and then giving them the opportunity to, to attack it. Um, I hate micromanagement. I'm not a micromanager. I hate being micromanaged. I'm sure you are the same. You're nodding your head at me. Um, and I'm sure a lot of people listening to the show feel that way too. But, um, so, so there has to be some trust in the people and that's why if you hire nines and tens, you, you can kind of let them run a little bit because once you give them the basics, they'll be like, Oh, I'm actually looking at this and there's a way better way to do this. And here's the piece of software we need to do it. Right. As opposed to like, oh, I don't know. I was thinking about it, and I, it just was—it's kind of hard, and I don't really get it. Like, those are two very different ways to run a business, whether yeah. it's just an army of one or a big company you're trying to scale. Yeah, and I hate to say it, but I've—I've I've been both of those people. I've been the kind of person where I've had a job where, literally, like ha- the, the the duties in the day were done in the first hour, and then I would just sit there waiting you know, but, and, and then I've been a person where every, every second of the day, I'm like, okay, how can I make this place better? How can I just get rid of headaches for my boss? And so it really takes that shift. And I think you called it a championship mindset. Um, and I'm curious, how would you define a championship mindset? Like, how would you define what you're looking for when you're trying to hire those nines and tens? <clears throat> That's hard, man. Um, I think, I think at a certain point you need like, like um, you look at track records, like resumes are nice and that sort of thing, but there's, you have to look at like, what have you done? Like, are you someone who has won in the past? Because if you, if you've won in the past, there's a good chance you could win again in the future. Right. And if you, if you just sort of have a, a track record of, Ho humming along, and you don't have anyone who's a raving fan of yours, and um, you know you don't really show any initiative. Obviously, that's sort of a red flag. But I also think that like there, there's kind of got to be an intuitive sense here of you know game recognizes game, and and if you are a nine or a ten, which again, if you're listening to a podcast like this, you probably are, or you're <laughs> someone who could be in the future if you just need to skill up a little bit. Um, but you will know, like, if you're really honestly true with yourself and you're like, is this person seriously a nine or a ten, or could they be? Um, like, you'll you'll if you're really honest and truthful about that with yourself, and and then ask yourself probably the same question about you looking in the mirror right um you could probably answer that better than i could because it's it's different for everybody like my, a nine or ten for me is definitely going to be in an organization i'm part of is going to be different than probably for you sure. um but if you get enough of those people around you and and you and you all work to elevate each other like that's how you win in in sport and in and in business in my in my opinion yeah yeah, I completely agree. Um, <clears throat> there's a, a saying, gosh, it uh, comes from, have you heard of Bigger Pockets, the, the podcast? Of course, yeah. Yeah, I mean, Love being in real show. estate, I mean, come on. Um, but uh, Brandon Turner on Bigger Pockets, he always says, iron sharpens iron. So <clears throat> I think it goes the other way, you know, game recognizes game, like you said, and having those people around you constantly keep you 
up to date on your skills and, and, you know, pushing the limit of your potential. Um, yeah. I, I want to kind of backtrack a little bit. So you 2016, there's the period after the Olympic games in mm-hmm. which you, you said you were kind of redefining things and trying to figure out what you wanted to do next. What got you through that transition period and what, what helped you choose real estate and, and kind of moved you forward? So, uh, I always wanted to be in real estate. Uh, my uncles on my mom's side and my grandfather there, uh, were, were bit are and were big time real estate developers in the Seattle area. My dad's a real estate attorney. His brother owns a handful of apartment buildings in the Philadelphia area. You know, real estate was sort of just inner woven in our family and just interactions we had, um, so I always figured I would go there, but but I actually thought it was going to be on the commercial side. Um, as part of some of the training trips I did to Chula Vista when I was training for that for that four year period, because um, there's an Olympic training center down there and just outside of San Diego, I stayed in these this couple's house a few times on Airbnb. And uh, long story short, is they were there during the day when we were when we were staying in between practices and. Um, I started just talking to them because they had uh, tile samples out on their kitchen. And it's like, their kitchen's really beautiful. They don't need to remodel this. What are they doing? And so I asked them about it and they're like, oh, no, 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 we're flipping a house or we've got a couple flips or whatever it was. And I was like, okay, so these guys are real estate agents. They're flipping houses. They're home during the middle of the day. He's training for an Ironman. She does outrigger canoe, kayak. They've got three kids who are pretty cool and normal. It's like, that sounds like a life that I want. So I'm going to learn out what they're doing. And, um, and basically kept conversations going with them through my training. They were super supportive of, of me personally, but of our, of our group as well. And, um, a week or so after the Olympics, they called me and were like, Hey, uh, we have an idea, uh, come down to San Diego. We want to talk to you. And two days in San Diego, um, they proposed starting a, a satellite office for me in the Bay area, um, got Get, get my real estate license, start this satellite office and, and use all their, their back end. And they would come up, you know, once a month or once every couple of weeks to help me. And, um, away I went. <laughs> That's cool. Uh, yeah. What, what do you think made them reach back out to you and say, you know what, this guy's a, this guy's a good one. I was always, I, I don't know. I mean, I guess the Olympian thing obviously helps and they got, they got to, I mean, they got to know me and I think saw my work ethic and saw that I was like a genuine person and really had a lot of skills that could translate well into this kind of business and, and had a desire and a hunger for it as well. So I think you kind of align that potent, that nine and 10 potential. Like I wasn't a nine or a 10 in real estate, but I could, I proved that I could perform pretty well in another area. Um, I was, you know, someone who was coachable and I was hungry for an opportunity. And, and I think they just saw the alignment there and just, and just went for it. Um, totally a risk. You know, I had no track record in business or real estate really. I had some sales jobs that I did okay at, but I was really focused on rowing at the time. So, mm-hmm. you know, bit of a track record, um, a lack of a track record in business, but you know, it, it's, it's one of those things when I think if you just know, you know, and, um, and, and, and I actually was listening to this today. Um, you know, the risk ultimately in hiring someone or opening up an office or, or bringing on an assistant or <clears throat> hiring an operations manager isn't necessarily in like hiring them and, um, you know, having it fail, like, and, and you owe them all this money. Like really what you have to do is set up a very strict specific trial period. And that's kind of what they did for me is like, okay, we're going to do this for 90 days and we're going to see how it goes. Um, you know, and if we think that if you do these activities and you bring in this many leads and get on this many appointments and yada, yada, then it should be good. And I just did the activity. They kept seeing that I was doing it, bringing in the results. Um, as was expected. And, and then it's just started to scale a little bit and keep going and keep going. And, and so, you know, when there's an opportunity, you know, you obviously have to put some guardrails on it and there's a, or a person to hire, like you put the guardrails on it and risk 90 days of salary and, you know, time, but 
you know, you'll probably learn something from it. And if, if they're someone who sees it as an opportunity, they'll probably rise to it. And that's what I think they saw in me. Yeah. I'm a big fan of trial opportunities because uh, especially how they did it. If, if, I mean, I've, I've had trial opportunities in my life when I didn't know it was a trial opportunity and I wasn't super fond of that, but you knew what was going on and you, you knew the guidelines and you knew exactly what to do. So you just play the game, you know? Yeah. And you know, that's like everything. Sh- a lot of people freak out when they hear like, oh, this is a trial in 90 days. Ooh, you know, but it's like 90 days is enough time to figure out if someone's going to be a good fit or not. And probably you're going to know within like two weeks, realistically, mm-hmm. if they're going to be a good fit. So let's mm-hmm. be honest. But, but you know, it's, it's a, it's still the way it's the best way to run things and to, and to determine if you really have someone who's on with your goals, who sees the opportunity, who gets it and can learn quickly, because especially if you're trying to run a business, like that's what you need. You can't hold hands for two years while somebody figures it out. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, that those are the, those are the kinds of things that you really need to be aware of and look for that kind of talent. Because then if you can, if you can devote 90 days of salary, of time, of whatever, and somebody doesn't work out, okay, too bad. You, you wasted 90 days and some, some money, but you know, it probably wasn't even a waste. It was probably just a learning experience. Yeah. And I think it's also important to remember that <coughs> this wasn't just a trial on some random person. This was a trial on someone that, that had opportunity conversing with being around. So they get the feel of you but they also see that you have driven results in another facet of your life. You've been a nine or a 10, like you've said. And so that demonstrates the mindset that you have. And so I feel like, like you're saying, it's not as much as a risk as, as people think because they have vetted right. you a little bit and they're like, you know what? He doesn't know as much about real estate, but he's been a terrific roller. So we know he has dedication. He has discipline. He can drive results and he can focus on results. So I think, you know, there's a good chance that he can do the same thing in this area. So I think it was less of a risk, like you're saying. <clears throat> Yeah. And they had the benefit of knowing me personally first. So that helps, but, <clears throat> but yeah, it, I, I think you hit it on the head there for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, we're kind of winding down. I wanted to ask another question before we transition to some of our final questions. Uh, just in reading your bio and kind of picking out things I was, I was really interested in. You mentioned that you, you married a rower as well, an Olympic mm-hmm. rower. And I'm curious, oh, yeah. how, how did you, uh, how did you meet your wife? Kind of how did all that happen? Well, as, as you may know, the, the rowing world, well, you may not know this, but you can imagine it's a small world, <laughs> especially when you get to the sort of the top uh, national team kind of levels. Um, there's only so many people who are at that level. So it's, it's everyone kind of knows everybody. Um, we knew of each other for years. And then uh, she was coming off of her, her uh, Olympic campaign in 2012, uh, stayed in the Bay Area and started training at the, the rowing club there. Um, I, was, I got cut from the 2012 team, went and finished school, and then was coming and doing like long weekend trips down in the Bay Area with the, with the group that was, that was stationed there. And we started to kind of get to know each other a little bit that way, just through osmosis more or less and then I moved there um officially in March of 2013 and uh and then obviously just got to know her through some of the social events and then we'd see each other at the boathouse and that sort of thing and and then you know realized that she was more than just a cool person she was someone I wanted to be around a lot more and then we started dating I think that October and we supported each other through our next handful of years rowing and that, you know, continued until, you know, through the Olympics, she was a huge part of a huge support system for me as to why I made that team. Um, I always tell people it takes a tribe to send someone to the Olympics individually. And like, I had a lot of host families. I had a lot of support financially as well as just other, you know, just, encouragement from family and friends you know she was a huge part of it because she'd already been to the olympics so she helped me with my mindset when things were low and um yeah and then we we decided to be done rowing and try real life for a little while and and then (laughs) ended up deciding that this is what we wanted to do and so we got married and here we are wow that that that's such a cool story um it's not every day that you uh 
I mean, not everyone finds their uh, their love while they're doing what they love to do. So that's really cool. Yeah, and it's funny if any of my friends um, would would hear me say stuff like, "I don't need to date uh, an <laughs> Olympic athlete," because um, I, I just wanted to date someone who was like fit and cared about their fitness and their well belt well being. Because I spent mm-hmm. so much darn time working out myself um, that I couldn't wrap my head around you know, someone who struggled to be on the treadmill for 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it, and then it's like, of course I find someone who's literally like my female opposite (laughs) in the like commitment to exercise component. It's like, of course that happened. (laughs) That's cool. Uh, And, and this is kind of a, a weird question. Are you guys planning on having kids in the future? It's not off the table, man, but you know, we spent the majority of our twenties competing with rowing Mm -hmm. and it's weird because we're almost like in our second careers because that was just like such an intense first Mm -hmm. career almost even though it wasn't paid um so now we're in these like quote-unquote second careers and we're we're still trying to figure that out i mean you know the kid thing is an interesting conversation that we we go back and forth on all the time and it's Mm -hmm. you know it's hard to say i i can't i can't tell you one way or another but you know we'll see if you guys do the the rowing world will have to watch out because uh, you know offspring of two olympians that is destiny right there you know <laughs> someone uh, uh said that at our wedding <laughs> made a joke about that <laughs> i mean it's just like guaranteed right you know the fates align so uh yeah absolutely yeah. but we are coming down to <clears throat> the last couple minutes here um so I want to ask you the last questions that I ask all my guests. Hans, based on our, our conversation today, what one to three action items would you give our audience to do today or this week to improve their lives? Well, if you guys are not doing this already, start, um, write down goals and don't just write them down once, but like start writing them down daily. <clears throat> and that can be in just a, 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 like a notebook or a piece of paper that you bring out every morning to start your day. But when you, when you engage with your goals uh, every day like that and you, and you write them as opposed to just think about them, it changes your relationship with them in a, in a way that I, I struggle to really articulate but is meaningful and real. So just do it for 30 days and, and if you do nothing else, write those down. Um, the, next, the next thing is, uh, you know, just get yourself on some kind of a routine and that 30, it could start with writing your goals down every morning. Um, but you know, something with some exercise and, um, you know, some, something health related, that's good for you, your body and your mind in that way. And then, and then with your goals. So you have, have that kind of carried out in front of you. Um, and then, and then I would say this is sort of a longer term thing, but really do an audit of the people around you. Like start to think through uh, who are the nines and tens in your world? Who are the people that you aspire to be like? What are the, who, who are the people they know? Um, and then really ask yourself very seriously, are the people that I spend all this time with really going to help me be the person that I want to be that I'm writing down on these goals every single day? Because if, if the answer is no, you probably have to make some tough decisions and, and maybe start spending time with some different people, right? Um, I, I can tell you that I've had to exit some relationships and some friendships. They sort of evolved naturally away just because of I was rowing so much and I was just physically in practice all the time. So I just, there wasn't those opportunities to go out and party and stuff. But, um, but then in my adult life, we have just separated in so many ways. And now I'm like, they're doing one set of things and their weekend activities are one thing. And then mine are very, very different, right? And now I find people who surround me in those areas and push me in those areas. So do that audit. I think, I think it'll be really challenging. It'll hurt. But if you really are committed to, to leveling up and going to where you want to go, then you have to, you have to start there. Yeah. Uh, those just speak to my soul. And let me just make something clear to the audience. Hans isn't saying text all of your best friends and saying, hey, we can't hang out anymore. He's saying, you know, spend more time with people who are going to lift you up and, and who you want to be more like, he's, you know, I just want to make sure no one's eating the yeah. wrong idea. Or anything. Well, you know, it might be, honestly, you might have to like, 
formally <laughs> end a relationship or you could just say, Hey, like I'm really trying to go through some stuff, mm-hmm. like some transformations right now. I may not be around as much just because I'm, I'm really focused on doing blah. Exactly. And if people are really your friend, they'll support you in that. Mm-hmm. And if they're, if they're not, and if that makes them uncomfortable, that's more about them than it is you. And you just learned something about that relationship. Exactly. Exactly. Well, well, Hans, how can people reach out to you, see what you're up to and support it if they want? Yeah, man. Um, well, the, the number one place is my podcast called Another Way to Play. Uh, you can find it anywhere that podcasts are available. Um, wherever you're listening to this one, you type in that or my last name, which is a lot harder to spell. <laughs> um, and which, well, if you're listening to this podcast, you can just copy paste it, but um, you can check it out there. And then I've got my website as well, which is uh, hansstruzina.com. I've got information about my podcast, my real estate practice, um, and some of the other things I'm up to there. And that'll take you to all my social stuff. Perfect. Awesome. I will get all those up in the show notes as well as your action items. You love my audience, but thanks so much for being on the show today. I, I enjoyed it a lot. It was fun. And uh, you, you enlightened me a lot about the championship mindset. So thank you so much. Yeah, man, really appreciate it. And uh, good luck to you. And, and thank you guys, whoever's listening to this. Thank you for tuning in. Appreciate it. And thanks for the opportunity to be on the show. My pleasure. Uh, I mentioned books numerous times today on today's show, so I want to give you the chance to listen to one for free. See, Audible offers over 180,000 titles on every single genre you can think of, so I want to give you the chance to get a free audiobook today from Audible. Just go to audibletrial.com slash thehardthingpodcast. You get a free audiobook as well as a free 30-day trial, which means other audiobooks at a discount. This allows you to start building up that championship mindset and maintain it so that way it stays with you forever. One book I would highly recommend is The Four Disciplines of Execution by Sean Covey. I talk about that a little bit today. Go get that book for free, audibletrial.com slash the hard thing podcast. Thanks for listening to uh, another episode. Like I said, it was a fun conversation. Uh, Hans is a, a, an outstanding guy. And frankly, it was inspiring to talk to him and uh, and, and talking to him, there were a couple things that I thought, you know what, I need to improve and, and go work on those. Uh, I'm not perfect. I'm just an average Joe like you guys. Uh, maybe you're not average. Maybe you're above average, which is what we're hoping you are and what we're trying to get you to be. See, our goal here, as Hans put it, is to get you to become a nines or a tens. Tens preferably, but nines is the minimum we want. We want everyone to be a nine. <clears throat> we want everyone to be the hero of their own story. I don't want you to regret anything in life, anything that you didn't do. I want, I want you to only regret things that you might have done wrong or things like that. But enough of that. Uh, it was an excellent episode. Stay tuned on Thursday for our Thursday meditation show. We have episodes Mondays and Thursdays. And uh, you're going to hear from me this Thursday. <coughs> Again, sorry, I had, a, I had a sickness or something. So my throat was a little bit wonky. But um, see you back on Thursday. And until then, keep doing hard things. And the more hard things you do, the more you will overcome average.